In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Yesterday, my beloved brothers and sisters in Christ, yesterday we celebrated the feast day of the Holy Transfiguration of our Lord and Savior. St. Matthew, in his gospel, tells us about the events of that day. He tells us that one day Jesus took three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John, and he led them, led them up a mountain to pray. He led them up Mount Tabor, And the disciples went with him, and they were to see something that was so astonishing, something that was so special, so awesome, that they would never ever forget it for the rest of their lives. While they were there with him on the top of Mount Tabor, they witnessed Jesus praying there on the mountain and then as they were looking at him he was transfigured. <coughs> His humanity was transfigured, transfigured before them and they now witnessed his divinity. They saw him shining brightly as the sun. They could hardly look at him. And they saw his tunic, his, his garments, and they were bright, brighter than the light. Now the disciples, as we know, had followed Jesus all over for three whole years. And they had never, ever witnessed such a thing. They saw him teaching, consoling, even performing <coughs> healing miracles. But they never saw anything like this. Shining on the top of the mountain in all his divinity, they were astonished. It was tremendous. It was as we say in today's language, it was awesome, beyond awesome. It was unusual, and they had never seen anything like this. The disciples of Jesus were witnesses to the glory of God. Illumination had come to them. They were now turned on to the true knowledge of God. Some of you, some of us, I know, I've spoken with many of you, and I know that many of you, many of us, have at some time in our life had a deep religious experience. I know that. You have told me. Many of us, and those with whom I have not yet conversed, I know that many, many people have had a moment, <coughs> maybe a few minutes, maybe an hour, maybe longer, when you actually felt the presence of God inside of you. You've actually, for a few moments, felt very, very close to God. Think about it. You felt God was there with you. He was there with you in the room. He was inside of you, filling you with His peace and His love and His goodness. It was a tremendous experience. And if we haven't had it yet, I pray that we will and you will. Tremendous experience 
a life-changing experience that we never ever forget. But that religious experience, as we said, usually is very brief for a moment, maybe for a few minutes, maybe a little bit longer, but it is brief. It doesn't last too long. The moment comes when it goes away and we are back to where we were. And we ask ourselves, my gosh, I wish this would last forever. I want to feel God inside of me all the time. And we wonder why that isn't happening. It isn't happening because that experience is a foretaste of what is to be when we are with God forever. It is in the next life we know that our life here is so temporary. I don't know if we're going to live a hundred years, but it's temporary. We're going back home. And when we go back home is when we have that full unity with Christ and we feel His love and His presence forever and complete. In this world, we have to work. In this world, we have to struggle. That's what it is in this life. It is a time when we have to struggle and yet grow little by little, day by day, grow more and more into the likeness of Christ. That is our purpose in this life, to become more like Jesus. And as we become more like Jesus, loving and giving and doing, then we experience the closeness of God more and more. But you know, there is also a possibility that having that experience of feeling God sometimes can be a little bit dangerous. Sometimes it can stunt our growth a little bit because there are so many people who talk about what God did for them 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And they're not talking about what God is doing now in this life today, they keep talking about the past instead of today and tomorrow. If you recall in the Gospel, Matthew tells us when the disciples saw this happening, they were so stunned, they were so overwhelmed that they said to Jesus, Jesus, Thank you for bringing us with you. Let us stay here. Let us make three tents and stay with you forever on the mountain. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. We must remember that after that great religious experience on the top of the mountain, we've got to come down the mountain to the valley below. The mountaintop experience prepares us for the work that we have to do in the valley below. And there is no work, there's no challenge, there's no problem on top of the mountain, no suffering, nothing to be concerned with in heaven. However, it is in the valley on this in this life that we have to face the challenges and the problems of life. Peter, James, and John wished, they really wished that they could have gotten away from the problems. My goodness, even at this time, they had been with him for three years, even at this time, they were suffering. It was hard to follow Jesus then, as it is even today. 
They were suffering. They wished that they could get away from the valley, go back up to the mountain and stay there, be in heaven with Christ forever. And like them, many of us, in different ways, we try to get away from this life in one way or another. Some of us try fantasy. Fantasy. The imagination. Well, the imagination is very nice. It's very nice to imagine wonderful things happening all the time, but fantasy can be dangerous if it goes on too long. Oh, we can try to run away by traveling. Oh, I think I'm going to go to Moscow next week. <laughs> I think I'm going to go to Athens. I think I'm going to take a drive to Washington, D.C. I haven't seen the monuments in a long time. And maybe if I do that, I'm going to forget some of the problems I have on Cape Cod. I'm going to try to run away by traveling, but you know what? You know, you've experienced it already. I go to Athens, I go wherever, and I take myself with me. Don't die. So we cannot escape the valley to travel. And then there are some people who try to escape the valley by religious emotion. And so we know people who go from one church to another, one denomination to another. The other day, I was talking to a young lady whose father was Orthodox, and her mother was Episcopalian, and the result of that mixed marriage was that they had no religion. So the young lady grew up with no religion, and so she was searching. I'll try the Baptist church. I'll try the congregation church. I'll even, perhaps, I understand the Unitarians have quite a speaker. I'll go hear what he has to say. And this particular young lady was still in the throes of the emotionalism of the Pentecostal church. She was born Orthodox. You know, she was trying to find God with emotion, shouting doing whatever Pentecostals do. And it was to no avail. And so I said to her, why don't you find out now, it's never too late, what did your father, how was your father raised? What is this Orthodox church? This ancient church? Maybe if you go back to what your father had, you will find what you have been searching for. I pray that you will. And so the three disciples and Jesus returned to the valley below. It is in the valley, in this life, that we have to do our work. It is in the valley that we are called upon to be Christians. To do for our neighbor. I don't care what your neighbor looks like. I don't care what religion, what race, what nationality, what country, whatever, whatever. It is in this life that Jesus says, love your neighbor the same way you love yourself. How do you expect to get to the mountaintop if you don't love everyone? It is down in the valley that we are to obey God's commandments and walk in his footsteps. Someone once said, and I love this quotation, Someone once said that no one can write about his real religious life with pen or pencil. You can't describe your religious life with a pencil. It is written only in actions and its seal, its seal is our character, not our orthodoxy. Our character, not our orthodoxy. My dear friends, that mountain dove experience lasts only sometimes for a moment. But I'm saying to you, it's enough. It's enough. If you have felt Christ for a second in your life, it's enough. It's a blessing 
It's just one sin our life we feel the closeness of God that we can go on. We can live how we are supposed to live in this life. We are called to become like Christ. Now some people sometimes misunderstand this. What, what, is, what is our priest talking about? What is our priest talking about? What is Father Nick saying or Father Michael sometimes or Father Patrick? What are they talking about when they say, I must become like Christ? How can I become like Christ? By loving, by serving, by forgiving, by doing, you are becoming more and more like Christ. You are achieving the reason and the purpose for which you were born in this world. That is the meaning of the transfiguration. What does the word transfigure mean? It means we're called to be changed. We're called to be transformed. We to become like Christ. More and more like Christ through our faith, our love, and our purpose. May it be so for each and every one of us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.